right here in my new home. And my first guest is Steve Sims, who's right here with me. Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you doing? Doing great. I got to say, I start stalking you on everywhere. And I realized <laughs> I wanted to stop because I wanted to have a conversation like your friend. Um, so, so Steve, you, your brand is amazing. Your brand with your own name, Steve Sims, but also you created Bluefish, which you know, creates these extraordinary, actually often unimaginable experiences for, you know, people who are super high profile, um, famous, and, um, you know, you're in, in all these pictures with them. So it, it's just such a, an incredible experience, but you have such a, also even more interesting origin story, in my opinion. So uh, could you please talk to us about that? Introduce yourself and then talk to us about your origin story before all of this. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm any. I don't think I'm any more different to any other entrepreneur out there. Um, you know, you can name drop, you know, celebrities and countries, but we, we're all the exact same. We've all got that DNA of aggravation where we want to do something different and we want to find out where we can fit. Well, mm -hmm. it started for me when I was 15 years old and uh, living in East London. And my my dad owned a very very small construction firm. So basically every, every holiday, every school holiday, I was on the building site. So it was no surprise that once I finished school at the age of 15, we have a slightly different schooling system in England, mm -hmm. um, that they would do, you know, 16. I was very young for my year. But you finish at 16 and then you go to college. Um, I didn't even know what college was. Um, so I finished at 15. He gave me one day to lay in bed and then the following day kicked to bed at 4.30 in the morning and said, right, you're on the building site. And that was it, that was my life. And I was just, I had this kind of sense of, is this it? You know, is this what my life is? And it was typical teenager, you know, I want to do this. So, you know, now bearing in mind, I was in a world uh, before Instagram could tell me how it, inadequate my life was. Um, so I never had any of these social feeds telling me that, that I was a waste of space and, until I had a yellow Ferrari that I could lean against. So <laughs> I just carried on through life ignorant but I was aggravated. And I think that's the stem of all entrepreneurs. We get into something and we look at a system, we look at a structure, we look at a platform, we look at a job, we look at everything and we go, is, is that the best we can do with that? You know, how, how, can, we, how can we make it better? Or how, how can we remove that step completely? Um, and that's what happened to me. And it was funny because I knew that I wanted to be more, but everyone that I was with, was very settled and, and happy where they were. And I couldn't understand why. I remember going into a pub and all my mates would know how much money they had. And once we'd had two, two beers, we'd throw all of our change on the table, you know, counting it all up, buy two more beers and then spread them between the rest of the glasses. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you're happy with this. You know, you're, you're, you're actually happy. No one here is pissed off about that apart from me. So... I went out to try and communicate with rich people because I thought to myself, they must know something I don't. So mm -hmm. a very stupid step, but you know, I've always said go for stupid. And I thought if I know rich people, I can ask them what makes you rich and keeps me poor. Um, and that was it. And funny enough, I ended up working on the door of a nightclub. And so when rich people came in, I started to chat with them and try to befriend them. Before you knew it, I was actually, oh no, I missed a step. I was actually in Hong Kong by now. I'd moved from London to Hong Kong because like all entrepreneurs, we quite often jump out of the frying pan directly into the fire. Mm -hmm. I wanted to break all connection I had. So I went for the furthest place I could. There was the chance of a job for me in Hong Kong. It failed. Um, what was you know, it? You know, you'll laugh at this. I actually went to be a trainee stockbroker. Um, I always, I can never understand this word settle. It never kind of, it, it, I can't spell it, understand it or tolerate it. But I thought to myself, well, if I want to be rich, and this was in the 80s, who were all the rich people in the 80s and 90s? Mm -hmm. They were all stockbrokers. We were watching Wall Street and everything. And I was like, that's what I want to be. So I applied for a stockbroking job in Hong Kong, actually got it, mm -hmm. and uh, turned up in uh, Hong Kong. I was in Discovery Bay. And um, went there for orientation on the Monday and I was fired on the Tuesday because they realized that I had no idea what I was doing. So I ended up working on the door and just talking to rich people. You know, um, some of them I would find out were not rich, but pretending to be rich. 
Mm. So I got really good at identifying those. Um, and then I started trying to find out what rich people wanted so I could provide because people will always stick with a solution. They won't always stick with a salesman, but they will always stick with a solution. So if you're solving someone's problem, that's where you breed up loyalty without needing the points program. So I started looking after that nightlife. And then I started throwing my own parties and it exploded to the point that I've been working with Kentucky Derby, the Grammys, the New York Fashion Week, uh, Sir Elton John's Oscar party. So I've uh, Formula One, Monaco. I've worked with the largest events in the planet. And along the way, they would say to me, hey, you know, there's a Hermes bag that's just come out, you know, and I, I need three of them. Or, you know, do, do you know anyone that could get me to play drums with Guns N' Roses or get me into the Vatican with the Pope or close down a museum? In and I ended up just doing it because, mm -hmm. again, I never understood why people settled I don't know. And that was it. And that's where I am now. Mm. There's so many things to break down here. And uh, hey, thanks for sharing your, your story because it's so memorable and it's unlike, it's not an ordinary story. So first I must ask, when you said they're rich people or pretend to be rich people in Hong Kong, you know, I grew up from Asia. I see, still see that a lot. And also in the US, doesn't matter where you are, San Francisco. Yeah, exactly. New York, how do you tell very quickly or how could you educate us on, you know, engaging with people who are rich versus actually rich? <laughs> this is, do you know, funny enough, it became a game. I love to game everything. Now, bear in mind, you've got to understand it. It doesn't take people. You've already sussed it. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm a blunt object that just gets the job done. And so I don't overthink, I quite often overdo. And when you're doing things like Jay Abraham, a friend of mine said, I have a greater I can than an IQ. But I fail a lot, but that's where I learn things. When I lost my job in Hong Kong, I ended up working in a, um, an area called Wan Chai. Uh, mm -hmm. And Wan Chai is like where all the clubs and seedy bars were in, in Hong Kong. And so I was working on the door and you'd have a guy pull up in a nice car and then get out. And you could play the game from that. I was stunned how the door, the doorman job gave me one of the best pedestals or soap boxes to watch the planet. It was kind of weird. You would see the car pull up and then the guy would get out of the car. Would he just kind of like, you know, talk to the valet guy, give him a tip, give him the keys and then just walk in after opening the door for his partner and go into the club? Or would he take a really long time putting his jacket on and staring around the audience just to make sure that they had seen him with that car? <laughs> and I noticed, I noticed then that there's a difference between you driving the car and the car driving you. Mm -hmm. And so it went further. You know, are you wearing that expensive suit or is the expensive suit wearing you? Are you wearing that watch or is the watch wearing you? How many times do you see someone, they bought a new watch <laughs> and for some reason, on their left wrist, that sleeve is always pulled up just so you can see it. Now, they're doing that for you, not for them. So that was usually the key indicator, you know, how insecure you were within your you know, monetary bit. Um, and you would get a lot of people that would sink a lot of money into a watch and then spend most of the night just making sure you noticed it. Mm -hmm. And those were the wannabes. Those were the entrepreneurs, you know, those, those were the people that weren't settled in themselves. And then you'll get other people. And I remember there was a tipping point, not a tipping, a pivotal point. So I had, if I can tell the story, is that okay? Oh, please. Uh, absolutely. Get ready, so I, people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not that exciting, but um, we've got some other exciting ones. So stick with the show. Um, I'll tell you my, uh, my Florence story in a minute. That'll get them back. But I was on the door of this club. And um, something had gone down inside. So, you know, someone yelled for me and my buddy to go inside to calm it down. Now, I always like to talk my way out of a fight because no one likes fighting. Being prepared to fight and wanting to fight are two different things. So, you know, I was in there and I was, but everything calmed down. They, they took some conversation and they took some uh, encouragement to leave without there being violence. So it was good. That was a win for me. So I'm leaning up against the bar. My fellow had gone out front door and I'm just looking at the club, just making sure the club's okay. And there'd been these four guys who I'd always played the game with and I'd always chatted with, okay? I hadn't yet started doing business with them, okay? And, but I'd always noticed them. And those were the guys that I went, oh God, I wish I was them. 
I wish I was one of that that crew. And there was always four of them, good looking lads, always in suit jackets. And I would imagine, are they attorneys? Are they mergers and acquisitions? Are they stock? I was always play that game. Trust me, I would fantasize about, you know, these guys, you know, what are they and how can I be one of them? And there was one of the girls, one of the hostesses, and, you know, let's be blunt, this was the 80s and 90s, and she's all dollied up and she's all looking very sexy. And she walks over to the four guys who have now, you know, got these girls all over them. So, you know, that's got their attention. And she puts down on the side of the table, and I saw this, she put down on the side of the table, the tab wallet, you know, the little plastic folder that looks like mm -hmm. leather that you slip your credit card in, yeah. okay, to, to pay your tab. So she goes over and she's like, thanks, guys. Thanks for a wonderful evening. She puts it down and they ignore her. Mm. The girls at the table had basically taken their focus, okay? Fair mm. enough. It's like three o'clock in the morning at a club, you know? They expect that. She starts to walk back towards the bar. Now, I was at the bar as she's coming back. He suddenly leapt up and made a very fast pace to come towards her. Now, of course, as the doorman, this alerted me because out of my, my peripheral, I saw someone come in <laughs> and you kind of like, you lock and load. What's going on? What's happening here? So I was aware, you know, what was he doing? Was he going to yell at her to be overcharged or something like that? So I just rose up, you know, I was prepared. Um, and he tapped her, didn't grab her arm, tapped her on the arm as though he was kind of like embarrassed to do it. Excuse me, excuse me. And she turned around and he said, I am so sorry. I didn't see you put this down. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. He gets his wallet out, pulls the card out, shoves the card in it, gave it to her and went, I'm so sorry. Thank you for a wonderful night. She took mm -hmm. it and walked off. And a few things occurred to me. One, he didn't manhandle her, okay? <laughs> you know, he didn't grab her or can I grab her by the waist to get a quick feel or any of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That was the normal. But he tapped her gently on the top of her shoulder. You know, literally, can I like this as though he didn't want to break her. And he was so genuinely apologetic. And here was the big thing that hit me. He put his credit card in to pay for his guy's drinks, all four of them, and whatever the girls were sponging out of the, uh, the drinks, which I know there were bottles on there, so they could have been champagne. But he didn't check the tab. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself... In a point of my life where I knew exactly to the cent how much money I had in my bank, this guy knew that his card would not make the noise that I was used to of the, eh, eh, sorry, sir, your card's been declined. You know, <laughs> it was that period of my life. Yeah. But this guy was so calm, so polite, so respectful, and didn't worry about it because he knew he had to make He didn't have to worry about the bar tap. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I want to be that guy. And that was what I started for. I made sure I got to know these guys so that I could talk to them a bit more and get to know what they wanted in the life. And I started directing them to different clubs and getting tips and then charging them to come to my party. So that was one of those pivotal moments that I thought people with money, they do behave differently. People without money, to pretend as though they have money, mm -hmm. they act like assholes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it is true because mm -hmm. I find myself in and out in U.S. and China and uh, even here, you know, there are a lot of very wealthy um, Asian people now living in North America. It's such a, a different experience. Just watch people, uh, people's behaviors. And um, I think things are also changing very rapidly in Asia as well. That's something that I, like you said, I always pay attention to that you can't just be rich and wealthy, but you actually have to be kind as well because you never know who's going to save you, right? You never know who's got your back. Well, you um, never know when you're not going to be rich. And let's be blunt, you know, you could, with the world moving so fast, you know, your, your job, your economy could suddenly be no longer required. You know, you could be, you could be out of business and it's those people that helped you get up there and those people that you were decent with that you could pivot. Let's be serious. This is the, the key word at the moment. Being able to pivot some of your uh, intellectual assets into a new industry and a new business, you need help with that, that transfer. I, I look at it like you're moving house, okay? Mm -hmm. You need people to help you move, okay? That's good. So or, there you go. Always rely, uh, always work hard to be able to rely on those people. And we are in a relationship economy. We're in a relationship economy and we're in a credibility economy. Mm -hmm. It couldn't 
that that couldn't be said better because I literally moved. I became a first time homeowner as of a week ago. And congrats. Thank you, Steve. And I haven't, you know, published, I try to be very sensitive to all of this. And it's a home I always wanted to build for me, my mom. And, you know, I haven't really shared on social media. I find it a little bit tacky, but exactly like you said, all the skills that I do not have are required to build and to touch up every piece of the house, the basement. And, you know, I'm so lucky to have uh, friends so close to me that I can trust to help me with through every step. Somebody's in the basement right now. Um, I must, I'm curious because I think about there's so many, there's some parallels to what you're doing, what I'm doing and what content creators are doing in general. Everybody thinks that they have to go after the big names, uh, in the world of podcasting, for example, it would be the, you know, the Tim Ferriss, I know who's your friend and, um, sort of, you know, Jay Abraham and, uh, Seth Godin, all of these people, um, it's kind of a two-part question. I'm really bad at, I always combine so many questions, but okay. I <laughs> the first the first part is how do you approach the ultra famous successful people how do you kick off a conversation what do you think it's the case that the myth is that once you get to know the one person like you know Elton John and Elton John's going to introduce you to 800 other people like what does that process look like in in the real world so let me play a little game with you all Please. right which will probably help you I do this when, I, when I'm on stage and stuff, um, literally as I walk on. So I walk into a bar and you're at the bar with your best mate. And I walk up to you and I say, hey, how you doing? My name's Steve Sims. I've worked with Elon Musk, Sir Elton John and the Pope. I'm a big deal. How are you doing? And I put my hand out to shake your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't believe you, <laughs> right? All right. I, I... Okay. All right. So I've got the response I wanted. Okay. So <laughs> you don't believe me. You are, I think we can safely say, repelled mm -hmm. by that instead of invited into a conversation. Mm -hmm. You're looking at me, a self-promoter, full of himself. I've got all the negatives in that introduction. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's play uh, scenario number two. I walk into the bar and I ignore you. Why shouldn't I? We don't know each other. And I walk to the end of the bar and I order my old fashioned and I'm there on my own. And your best mate elbows you in the rib and you say, you see that guy over there? That's Steve Sims. He's worked with Elon Musk, Sir Elton John and the Pope. That guy's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. what do you think? Oh, I totally trust my friend. I, you know, like it's like a referral almost. Um, it's a trusted source. It's a credibility crux. Absolutely. Yeah. So the bottom line is I realized very early on, never introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. So I've always found people that I know that I trust that have been able to introduce me. Um, and they, and this will probably lead nicely into my, my Florence story for you. Um, but I've always found ways for people to introduce me from one angle to another. Um, and I'll, I'll, tell you the one story that I had for, for Florence, um, which is a little bit sexier than the, the story about the, the, the guys in Hong Kong. But I had a client of mine contact me because he wanted to have a dining experience to impress his mother-in-law and father-in-law in Florence. And the key word that he had used was experience. He didn't say, you know, he wanted a meal. He didn't say he wanted a, a great table. He said he wanted a dining experience. Mm -hmm. That changes the whole thing. So on uh, this, this was Sunday and I was in Rome at the time and I'd had a couple that had actually retained me to get them married by the Pope. So I was in Rome at the time and the client knew I was there. So I had some downtime. And so I said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll do that. And it was for Wednesday night. So I went down to Florence and come Wednesday night, he got picked up in a horse-drawn carriage. Have you, have you been to Florence? Did you say Florence? I wasn't. Uh, Florence, Italy, yes. Okay, yes, yes, I okay. have been. I love it. And you know it's small. It's yeah. a small place, isn't it? So mm -hmm. my client gets picked up outside the Savoy Hotel in the main public square, and mm -hmm. he's in a horse-drawn carriage. It's him, his uh, fiance, her mother and father, and she's brought a friend, okay? Mm -hmm. They start clippity clopping off around the cobbled streets of Florence. They go past uh, Palazzo de Vecchio. They go past the Diamo. They go up the street where it's the uh, side street for the Academia de Galleria, the museum that houses Michelangelo's David. Mm -hmm. As the horse-drawn carriage pulls up outside the door, my client jumps out, starts banging on the front door at nine o'clock at night. 
So he's banging on the door. The fiance turns around and says, hey, you know, calm down, calm down. He's like, no, no, no. In here is Michelangelo's David. I'm just wondering if there's a cleaner inside that I can give a couple of thousand lira or something to, and we can get to quickly see it before we fly back tomorrow. <laughs> She's like, it's nine o'clock at night. That's not going to happen. He carries on banging. The parents or the future mother-in-law and father-in-law are looking at this guy like he's a psychopath, you know, and this is what's coming into the family. But as he's doing that, the doors open. And there was a red carpet that leads down to the feet of Michelangelo's David and a table of six, a table for six set up and a string quartet to the left. Sweet. On the red carpet are all of these rose petals. And mm -hmm. so they invite them in and they get to walk down, walk around. We had closed down the entire museum. Mm -hmm. And at the feet of, the, of David was the table. They've had champagne, they had some hors d'oeuvres, they sit down, they start having their meal. Halfway through that eating that pasta, I informed them that I've got hold of a local entertainer to sing with them during their dinner. Is that okay? And of course they went, yes, that's fine. So I go off, come back on, and I brought Andrea Bocelli out to serenade them while they're eating that pasta. That's the kind of thing that I do, okay? Now, I wouldn't have gone anywhere because I had none of those connections. So what I did was I had to contact people that I knew in Florence, very, very... Uh, powerful people. And I went, hey, I've got this dream of what I want to do. And I want to do a dining experience that's ridiculous. Now, the first thing I do in anything, in my coaching, in my, um, in my speaking, in my anything I do in life, I go for stupid. I told you already about how I hate the word settle. Go for stupid. What's the most ridiculous? Not what's impossible. Mm -hmm. That's like saying, hey, I'm going to drive through this dead end. You're already acknowledging it's impossible. It's a negative. Why am I going to run at a negative? So I've never understood that statement. I go for stupid. What's ridiculous? What's absurd? Go for that. The most absurd idea I could have for an Italian meal in Florence was to shut down the academia and eat it at the feet of Michelangelo's David. So I contacted these powerful people who introduced me to someone else, who introduced me to someone else, and eventually introduced me to the board and some of the serious investors of a donator, should I say, of the Academia de Galleria, who allowed me to come in on their credibility. Now, I told you that I was working with the Vatican at the time. I wanted to get hold of Andrea Bocelli. I don't know Andrea Bocelli, but I know Elton John. Maybe I could get Elton John to call him. But what I did was I, I was on a call with the Vatican and I asked them, do you know Andrea Bocelli? And they said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, can you do me a favor? can you phone them and let them know that I would like to work with them? And they were like, sure, no problem. So you had the Vatican phone in Andrea Bocelli to introduce them to Steve Sims. How could you have said no to any of those introductions? Mm, I, I so, see. So Always, always. I've never introduced, let's be blunt. You know, you were introduced to me by someone else. Yeah. Um, so I came in on that credibility. But if you saw me walking down the street or if at 10 o'clock at night you came out of a bar and you saw me walk in the other direction, your, your first instinct would not be to run up and hug me and say, hey, how are you? You look interesting, <laughs> would it? Let's be black. Exactly. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, you know, but it's interesting. I, I think you're, you, you portray, you know, I think a certain image, but the same at the same time, you're such a gentle person. You know, like it's, it's so... Sometimes it's so easy to, I don't know, misread people and um, that introduction can really go a long way. But I got a creative, there's a lot of creative design, creative thinking involved in everything you do. So I wonder, do you personally design a lot of the experiences or perhaps you have a team of people, I don't know, friends who will contribute like on a whiteboard to say, this is how we're going to do it. And in the part two is, what if it doesn't happen? What if this beautiful experience at some point that, that you couldn't get the singer or this, something falls through? Like, what do you what do you do in that All scenario? Right. So two, two great questions. Mm. For a start, um, any client that's worked with me comes to me with very, very small detail because they know I'm going to overthink it. OK, so you get the client that comes to you and they say, hey, I want to do this and this and this and this and this. And they've never worked with you before. And they give you all of this stuff and you go, great. So I've always came up with the idea and the concept. Never give a client what they ask for. Give them what they lust for and desire for. OK, you've got to get beyond what it is they're asking for, because even when even when you ask, if you said to someone. 
hey, you won a million dollars this weekend. What would you do? They would turn around and go, oh, you know, I'd, I'd get a plane and I'd go to Vegas and we'd party all night and I'd buy a Lamborghini for all my friends. And they would say things like this because it'd be a knee jerk reaction. But if you said to them, OK, three months down the line and you've still got all your money, what would you do? You'll notice that they'll suddenly start thinking they're going, well, my mum's always wanted to go and visit so-and-so or the school that I grew up could never afford a science lab. I want to donate a science. All of a sudden it changes. You've got to get beyond the initial. Now, again, if you think of today's society, we're in a transactional sense society. Siri, do this. Alexa, do this. Amazon, deliver me toilet bowls. If you don't think we're in a, a transactional community, Try and phone up Amazon and tell them you're thinking of changing the brand of toilet roll and which one should you get? You can't do that, okay? So what you've got to do today is not only accept the request, but then you've got to create and disrupt to get to what they really want. Mm. So never give anyone what they want. Always give them what is just insane. Now, here's the beautiful thing. I have failed millions and millions and millions of times. I've always gone for stupid and quite often failed. I would say I probably failed 80% of the time, maybe even 90% of the time when I've tried to get the White House to close down for a picnic party or something like that. <laughs> but I've always then fallen short by getting the next best thing or maybe the next best. The bottom line of it is I've always gone well beyond what the client wanted. The client wanted a dining experience. I gave him the academia. I had a client that wanted to meet the rock band journey. I actually get, got him called up on stage and he sang four tunes live on stage with the band and is now deemed as the shortest term lead singer of the rock band journey. <laughs> I always take it further than what I'm requested. And because I fail so often, but because I was never going for that initial re request, as far as they're concerned, I've never failed. I have never, ever failed on a client's request, quite simply because I have never gone for what they first asked me. Mm, do you think that comes with a lot of trust? Because now you have a reputation. You are one of very few of these organizations who do this and you do exceptionally well. Um, what I mean, what was it at the beginning? I would love to hear like the young Steve trying to put together this impossible mission, impossible this journey. And then let's say a client yell at you for it. That's maybe that's not what I want. Maybe you're, you know, this is a moonshot. Like I, I don't even want to engage in this creative conversation. Like what do you do then to convince them that what you're doing is ultimately what they want? Ah, uh, well, there's a lot of questions in there to unpack. Um, so I train entrepreneurs on this now. Um, we have a free community, so there's no pain, but we have an entrepreneur's advantage on uh, Facebook with me, Steve Sims. And we try to teach people to get out of the way of mm -hmm. their ambition and dreams. Mm -hmm. And you're paying a lot of respect to me by making out as though I've got a lot of creative intelligence. And I would love to thank you for that, but it's, 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 it's inaccurate. Um, my wife, who I've been, been with for 35 years, says I have the superpower of ignorance, okay? Mm -hmm. I've never been frightened of going for something. So many people are scared. You say to someone, if you could do anything, what would you do? And they'd go, oh, I'd like to play piano with Elton John or something else. Mm -hmm. If you shut up for a few seconds, they will then naturally just start to go into all the reasons why that could never happen. Mm -hmm. They will naturally talk to themselves. They'll say, oh, I'd love to play piano with Elton John. But he will never talk to me. I don't know how to get hold of him. I can't even play piano. And they will give them all the reasons. People spend time and energy on telling themselves why it can't happen. Mm -hmm. Now, you said earlier about branding. And I'm a great believer that branding is quite a myth. Okay? Mm -hmm. As I openly say to my students... It's a unicorn with three testicles. It doesn't exist, mm -hmm. okay? Because branding is what people say about you when you've left the room. Mm -hmm. Now, you can create the message. You can create the tone. You can try and install the logo. But if you haven't done it properly or if you've confused the clientele, then there's a problem. But branding is all what 
other people say about you, not what you say about you. Now, the funny thing was, as I was growing up, I didn't want to have a company. I didn't want to launch the world's largest experiential concierge firm. I didn't want to launch uh, a book. I didn't want to launch a coaching pro. I didn't want to launch any of these things. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get into the minds of people that thought differently. And these things I launched were vehicles in order for me to do so. But along the way, because I never cared about branding, I would always turn up on a motorcycle, always wear a black T-shirt, tattoos, eyebrow piercing, all that kind of stuff. I got a brand out of it. I got an image out of it. But my focus was, I'm not here because you found me on Tinder. I'm here because you want me to solve a problem you have, whether it be a cocktail story, whether it be a business uh, uh, development, whether it be um, trying to make a fantastical holiday for your family because you haven't been together for like two years, whatever. I'm here to solve a problem. And in the classic style of marketing, if you're going to buy a diamond ring, um, if someone's going to buy you a diamond ring, let's say five of said they turn up with two things. One of them is a brown, brown paper bag. Say for them sake, it's a McDonald's bag. <laughs> and inside of it is a little white tissue and you unload that tissue and there's a beautiful diamond ring there. Okay. You may be happy. Okay. <laughs> but let's say for them sake, the person that delivers the ring to you now provides you with a Cartier box. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> probably it's a one. Probably the first one. Even though I'm not a diamond person, but still. You'd prefer the uh, brown paper bag. Yeah. Why? I, I I like that kind of surprises. I like to kind of unfold and see something that I didn't quite expect. All right. Sadly, you're one of the rarities. Most people, <laughs> most people look at the Cartier box. Yeah. As the sign of credibility, that the diamond mm. ring in there has to be better. Now, the blunt fact is you could go to the jewelry district in New York and get a far superior diamond yeah. that is not stamped with Cartier mm. and stick it in that brown paper bag. But most people look at the packaging. But if you look at the reverse of this, if you've got a headache, if you've got a headache at 2 a.m. in the morning, mm. do you have any care about the packaging on the headache tablets? Mm -mm. No, Fixed because they're there to solve a problem. When mm. you're solving a problem, you actually don't have to worry about the marketing and branding anymore. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to sell a Hermes, a, uh, a, a Tiffany, a Cartier, that's where you've got to start working on your aspirational marketing. You've got to focus on the brand. So for me, I never did. Uh, I never cared when I was turned down and mm -hmm. I got turned down a lot but it always gets me closer to a no. I would always, I came up with these little things along the way. And if someone said no to me, the first thing I would do was look at them and say, are you actually capable of saying a yes? Are you in a position of power where you could say yes to me? Quite often, I realized I was asked, either asking the wrong question or quite often, more often than not, I was asking the wrong person. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if you go up to the Met Gala, and you go up to the valet boy and go, hey, can I go in? He can't say yes. Mm -hmm. So you're asking the wrong person. So I always, there were two things that I lived by. One of them was you're either asking the wrong question or the wrong person. And the other one is there's always two doors into a house. Mm -hmm. So if you can't get through one, go and knock on the other. Mm -hmm. And when that one you can't get in, there's always windows. So there's always multiple ways to get into where you want to go you've more than likely just asked the wrong person. So as I grew, it was the ignorance of not caring about branding that allowed this kind of gruff, weird look to actually work for me because I was walking into it. You imagine if you met someone and they started talking to you about business and they were naked, okay? <laughs> totally naked, okay? <laughs> but they solved your problem. Yeah. Would you recommend them to someone else who had the same problem? If they solve the problem, yes, I would. Bingo. It's a little awkward. <laughs> it, but there you go. Well, here's the thing. That mm -hmm. awkwardness now becomes that branding, doesn't it? Hey, this yeah, guy, he's going to solve your problem, but you know, keep the kids out of him because he always turns up naked. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now that becomes the trademark. It becomes the brand. Now that person is doing everything he can not to brand himself by even removing his clothing but because of the awkward trigger that he's created in you, 
he's now established himself a fantastic brand and unicorn, hasn't he? Mm. I love this marketing uh, and, it, you know, branding, personal branding kind of demystified because I think we can break it down even further because you're, you're solving problems that people with money can't always buy, um, can't really solve for themselves, or simply it's not just a problem that can be solved with money, but also in your case with creativity and connection. So I think a lot of creative entrepreneurs who are watching this right now, you know, sometimes we make the mistakes of thinking that this problem is really big in our head. You know, they're fitness creative entrepreneurs, like, yep. oh, fitness, of course, get off your butt during the pandemic, you should be healthy. And you know, your family can love you, you and all that. But Oftentimes, like when you're trying to sell to a client, uh, other clients prospects, they don't realize the significance as the problem appears in your own head. Like, how do you teach people to solve the right problems or go after the right problems to solve? So um, you're right about the money. If you want Elton John to hang up on you, just phone him up and go, hey, how much will it cost me to get you to come to my barbecue party? Mm -hmm. And you're just here click mm -hmm. the second you try to buy something you prostitute it mm -hmm. and no one wants to be a bulk commodity so you've got to say hey i want to create this experience and i want you to be a pinnacle part of that experience you've got to get them into your mm -hmm. story okay mm -hmm. and the money will come up but that will be an, an afterthought that'll be oh by the way send me your invoice it'll be that kind of thing but when you're working with a client, and you're right, most of our problems are actually our problems because we've developed them and grown them in our heads. So what you've got to do, and this is what I talk about a lot of, is you've got to poke the bruise. You've got to expose what someone's problem is. If someone's listening to this and they're fat or they're chubby or they put the pounds on during COVID, you know, are you comfortable about that? You know, you, you, you put these extra pounds on, that's going to be a bit aggravating, hasn't it? Because you've had all of this time where you could have been doing more exercise. In fact, if you'd have been doing exercise with your family, not only would you have been getting rid of those pounds, you'd have been connecting with the family because the byproduct would have been that you would have been spending dedicated time and you'd all be growing your health pattern, okay? Mm -hmm. And also, here's one of the biggest dangers we got is COVID has gone, has gone past two weeks, okay? It's gone heavily into the habit-forming period. So the habits that you've built during COVID are now going to be tough to, to get rid of, okay? Think of all of the people that are never going to send their kids back to school because they're used to homeschooling. Mm -hmm. They're never going to want to go into the office because they've now set up a perfectly adequate studio at home, okay? Mm -hmm. They don't want TV anymore because there's always bad news. They're just going to stick to the, to the shows that they can buy, like, you know, Peacock and Netflix and Amazon Prime. I got rid of my satellite TV purely and simply because of that. We've created habits. So you've got to poke the bruise and expose it. And most people don't realize it's there. So it's you've got to ask the questions that they haven't asked themselves. Are you happy with the way this is? How's your finances? You know, are you happy with the way that as COVID has come along, it's, it's exposed mm -hmm. how fragile you are with your money. Just imagine if COVID carries on for another two years mm -hmm. and you're depleting your. Are you comfortable with that? So you've got to poke the bruises and answer the questions that people haven't verbalized yet. Mm, I That's love that. You become the solution. Because when you, can, when you can expose the bruise, then you can actually come up with a solution and a problem that's going to get that bruise away. And again, people want pain to go. If I offer you two things, and I, I did this on a stage once, and it was kind of a bit weird. Um, but if I was to walk on stage and say, hey, run out the back door. I've got six beautiful women out there, each holding a suitcase. And in each one of those suitcases is $100,000. I'll stop talking. Go and get it. How many people in the auditorium do you think run out to look to see if there was a girl out there? <laughs> I depends on where you're giving the speech, but in it general, was, I would think people would be questioning that deeply. It was in San Diego, and I saw a couple of the doors open up at the back, but only by the people that were actually leaning on them. All the people out front were kind of like, you know, what's all this about? And kind of like <laughs> looking at each other and quizzical. Yeah. Now you imagine another scenario. <laughs> I come running onto stage, I grab the microphone, I don't say anything other than the word fire. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think now run out that back door? Everybody. We move on pain 
Mm-hmm. And we're slow to respond to inspiration, motivation, or anything that's going to improve us. If I had had those six girls out there, I doubt anybody would have known about it. Okay. <laughs> but the second I give you something that's going to hurt, yeah. you go for it. So the best way to market is to find out what your problem is. You know, mm-hmm. what's hurting you and how can I remove that pain? Once you start focusing on that, it goes back to the branding. You don't have to care what I look like. Mm-hmm. I love when you address on the pain because a lot of people are living in pain at various levels. And you pinpointed something even at the very beginning, which is we're still living in the pandemic. The vaccine may be coming out soon, but I mean, people like you, myself, and probably people who are watching this are not going to be getting it right away. It comes down to the essential workers and people, you know, elderly people, maybe children. Um, and you talked about the idea of pivoting. And that is something a lot of my clients are struggling with because it's a situation that even though we saw coming from afar, but then it kind of, you know, came and appeared and became very severe in the States uh, very, very quickly. And so people don't know how to react and respond. And like you said, you could be like, actually you, you know, very wealthy in this event business. And now you can't just deliver, send your clients to go to Vatican city, have a wedding, um, you know, overnight, like how, I guess, how have you pivoted will be part one of the question. And what can people listening to this to say, like, damn, how, how am I supposed to do that? Is that a mindset shift? Is it something that they can practice and, and exercise on today? All right. So again, a lot of good questions. There, so let's unpack them. Um, okay. so I have, um, I did a book blue fishing, the art of making things happen that came out about two and a half years ago. Prior to that, nobody knew who I was unless you were a billionaire. That's, that's the bottom truth. Cause I never marketed, I never branded, never bothered mm-hmm. in any of that. I just focused on those clients. Um, and then when the book came out, that's when I started doing Sims distillery and started doing speakeasy events and things. So I already had these two things going on. One, the experiential concierge and one, the online presence to basically go, hey, if a brick lad from London could be doing this with Elton John, you're already out of excuses. So I already had that. When my income fell and I have a lot of Asian clients. When my income started to go south last December, when we started to feel something was happening, it was happening, it was a tidal wave. It was happening over there first. And I suddenly saw in the finances, in December, we started pivoting more into the how can we help people um, on a digital world. So we were very lucky, but it was a mindset. Now, Mm -hmm. here's the big thing. When the pandemic, forget the word pandemic, okay? Mm -hmm. We're in a moment of distortion and distraction. And we have the zero thing that we need after oxygen, and that's clarity. Most people don't like change. We all get flustered when, it's in, uh, when we're coming up to the change of a new president. We always get flustered when we're moving into a new house. Mm-hmm. You know? You mm-hmm. know the house is a beautiful thing for you to be excited about, but how many times do you get stressed about it? Oh, my God. Yeah. Right? So we don't like change. Yeah. And now we've been forced on it. Mm-hmm. Now, the recession does the same. 9-11 did the same. Any of the wars and the political upheavals did the exact same. As an entrepreneur, we first off need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because entrepreneurs are always trying to do things in the space that they're not built to do it in. And we always want to disrupt. I talk, I talk to, to my people and call them creative disruptors. Okay. We've got to be able to disrupt and we've got to be able to create two things that AI can't do. Okay. And it's the, it's the mind shift. The richest person on a rainy day is the guy selling umbrellas. So the second we found it fell into that distortion and distraction, and this one just happens to be called pandemic. What if we fall into a recession next year? You know, what if something uh, we get the plague two years after that? Maybe, God forbid, there's a war. You know, (laughs) these are all moments where we lose clarity because we fall into an area of I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you have the decision and the person and I call these entrepreneurs, the person that decided on day way of day one of the clampdown of a pandemic to just binge watch everything they could on Netflix. That person's not an entrepreneur. But how many entrepreneurs on the day one of close turned around and went, okay, 
I don't know how long this is going to last. So how can I make this work for me? Mm -hmm. How can I start doing more podcasts? How can I start doing more live streams? How can I start sending out better content on my emails? How can I start building up a community? How can I say the how to, how can I, is those people that are aggravated that actually make movement. And as a good friend of mine, Joe Polish says, it's aggravated oysters that make pearls. Mm -hmm. We as entrepreneurs focused on doing something better during this time of distraction. Mm -hmm. Not the entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs. So if you're sitting there, your finances have been impacted. Everyone's has, mm -hmm. but not your dreams and your goals. How can you look at what you do, reevaluate your assets, and then offer them out there to solve someone else's problem? Mm. Love it. Because the moment I felt like I, I was already not very interested in TV since I became an entrepreneur before, before that working full time, it was such an escape, something I really look forward to. The moment I became an entrepreneur in, in early 2016, I lost all interest. Like doesn't matter. Could be my favorite shows like pen 15. I could just not watch it. I could just pause in the middle of an episode, be distracted. I have to write an idea down on a notepad or whatever it may be. And exactly like you said, the moment you, you pinpointed so accurately, the moment we hit the pandemic in March, I said, I'm going live with every single episode, reducing production costs and reaching more people. And by the way, while I'm at it, I'm going to teach all the other content creators to do the same. So my community started to grow and other people started experimenting that, you know, months later after I've told them with the tutorials, and now they're seeing an uptick in all their engagements, whether it's being an author or a podcaster or whatever it may be. So that hunger has served us, a lot of us really well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the difference. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll call a little bit of uh, bullshit here. I don't think you became an entrepreneur. I think you just revealed the entrepreneur you were. I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think you can become an entrepreneur. I think you just suddenly give in to the fact that, hey, you're different, you know, time yeah. to be me. So I think you just let it out. Yeah, oh, I, you're right. Cause I couldn't, I feel so unsettling if I don't start doing something such as, you know, I was in a, a, a meeting and there are many breakouts. I know you facilitate a lot of these sessions and um, the timer as a feature was, I feel like should be built into Zoom, but it's not. So you end up having these breakouts with four people. Each person is supposed to talk to two minutes, talk about two minutes each, 10 minutes, you know, eight minutes later, it's the same person. So everyone's struggling. He's like, am I the timekeeper? I don't want to be rude. So I de developed this little timer uh, thing. It's a, it's like this super silly video. And after I launched, it, I've sold, I've sold close to like a hundred copies and I did it in like five minutes. So, um, I, but like you said, the moment I saw that opportunity, I had to do it. It was one in the morning. So um, I, I don't know. I, I almost feel, I almost feel a little rude for like, I'm not celebrating the pandemic. I know it's been super painful, but it somehow it forced me into a new territory a new way of thinking and be able to connect with people like yourself who probably wouldn't be otherwise too busy to even get on the show. So thank you. Well, for I'm going to, I'm going to, there's been, there's been a lot of unfortunates within COVID, mm. but there's been a lot more positives. And this may sound funny, but uh, my wife pointed out to me in March that in March, when we didn't travel because of the first month of COVID, mm. um, uh, she said, that's the first time I haven't traveled in a month for nine years. Wow. So I've been with that beautiful woman for 35 years. I've spent all of this time just with her. My garden's good. My business is good. My wardrobe's clean. My garage is clean. I actually think there's stuff in COVID that you can be very, very grateful for. And I also think... It's an amplifier. You see, if you're in a good mood on a Friday night and you drink a couple of wines or a couple of whiskeys, it heightens your happiness, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If you're miserable and depressed and you have a couple of drinks, what does it do? Uh, it depresses it you. Worse. Yeah. That's the same with COVID. How many businesses were already fragile before COVID came along? Now, there's been a lot of innocence, your local sandwich shop, but if your business was already teetering on, on trouble, or if your relationship was teetering on trouble, COVID has just amplified it and exposed it. Eh, that needs to clean up. So it's, it's been very good. It's how you accept it. Mm. And I've accepted We did something that um, we're doing on the 9th, actually. One more. Um, 
we, and I'd love you to come, it's the virtual happy hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when COVID came along, I realized that every Friday night, I would at five o'clock in the evening, pour myself an old fashioned and just look at the week. You know, did it go to plan? Did it go as I wanted? What did I learn from it? And I would just analyze the week. So we would all do it in my family. So when COVID hit, I said, look, this Friday, COVID is not going to stop me pouring an old fashioned. Do you want to join me via Zoom? And we'll just chat about the week and tell bad dad jokes. No promotion, no selling, uh, none of that. Um, and it took off. And we ended up doing 19 virtual happy hours. And then we did the breakfast club uh, in the Entrepreneur's Advantage. And this was with no alcohol because it's like at 10 o'clock in the morning. But it suddenly started growing. And I realized, as you say quite accurately, people still want to connect mm -hmm. more than ever. Mm. So give them a way to do it. And we did it by literally telling, and trust me, if you do show up, these are really bad jokes. We pick the worst dad jokes mm. known to mankind. And we just sit there talking about nothing of impact, just drinking <laughs> whiskeys, cup of coffee. we got people all over the planet that are waking up in the morning, drinking their morning coffee, watching us lot and chatting with us and telling bad jokes. So give people what they, what they want that maybe they weren't aware of. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Is anybody welcome to join or is that kind of a more yeah. exclusive group? No, it's not exclusive. Um, we literally, it sounds, I'm doing it again, but an entrepreneur's advantage with Steve Sims is the Facebook page. Yes, it's free of charge. Jump in there and the Zoom link's in there. And mm -hmm. you want to share that Zoom link with cool people? Fine. If we find that they suddenly start talking about an online course they can sell for 20, so we're just going to mute them and delete them and probably laugh at them as well. But we just want everyone to get together. There is no promotion. None. Mm -hmm. It's literally just pour a drink. Okay, who's got the first ridiculous joke or who's got something that's happened in their neighborhood? And you'll have people going, oh, well, the, the bars have opened up here. And oh, this is, and we just chat. So it's anybody that just wants to get together and hang. No, and that's the next one we've got is on the 9th of October, mm -hmm. um, five o'clock till six o'clock Pacific. Jump in the Facebook group, get the Zoom link. We'll see you there. That's amazing. Wow, that's in a week. So I can't can't wait yeah. to go check it out. So um, it, it's great. I mean, this is, has been amazing. I knew when we had that quote unquote prep call, uh, could have easily talked to you for a long time <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, your description. So if you want to uh, connect with Steve Sims, including the Facebook group, he just uh, mentioned. So all the links are in the description below. doesn't matter where you are on YouTube or on Facebook. So um, Steve, before I let you go, I highly respect your time. Is there anything else that you would like to share, but I haven't asked? Uh, your questions have been great, but I'm hopefully going to give you a slight mindset mantra. Um, my dad is a big, well, he was a big Irish lump of a bloke. Um, very powerful, not exactly a, an articulate man. Um, but we were walking down the street once and I was about 13, 14 years old. And without looking at me, he said, son, no one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where this had come from. We weren't in the middle of a conversation. It made no sense to me. In fact, I stopped because it didn't make any sense to me. But I've realized that over my career and over my life, I've fallen in the water a ton of times. And it's my decision, mine, mine alone, as to whether or not I stay there. So for anyone out there to thinking this is a tough time, yeah, it is. But you can actually stand up and get out of it and shake it off. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for your time, Steve. And it's just so fun chatting with you. Thank you for all the stories. Um, really look forward to doing this again as well in the future. And I love to engage in the Facebook community more. And for those of you, you know, Steve really believes to believes in sharing about his knowledge and connecting with more people and having creating these networks of people. And, and I think it's just lovely because then you don't have to start, you know, your own. So you can just hop right in and be part of that community. So um, thank you again, Steve. I'm going to take us offline right now. See you so later. Bye.